This is Karina. I was going to point out something that I've been finding in, uh, I found in um, this program. I'm sitting here editing some text, and this is an iPad. And uh, the video you're watching is, don't worry about it, it's on YouTube, but it's a link, and a link only video, so nobody can see it except you guys. And uh, I've noticed with the editor, if I, sometimes if I go in here and I start putting in, start working with some text, sometimes it'll lose its place. So like if I'm, I'm trying to, let me see, I'll go up here and I, I want to work on some text here and then I want to put in a number or something. You will notice from time to time, it's not doing it for me now, but from time to time it'll it'll do it someplace else. And it will do it kind of where I think there this is probably where it would occur. So if I do that, but if I, I like move it here like that, maybe, and I do this, eventually it will screw up and it'll stick it in the wrong place. And I think, I'm, I'm pretty sure it isn't the iPad. I'm pretty sure it's on Microsoft's end. And uh, this is the reason why I advise um, all companies don't use Microsoft products because they really don't have that many programmers working on their solutions. Um, if you're a programmer, you know, uh, if you're a program manager, somebody that uh, manages a project, you know that the limit for the number of programmers to assign to um, anything that isn't completely object-oriented um, is seven. You should not have more than seven programmers. Um, the optimal number is about three or five. It's in that area. Seven is the max. And the reason why is because if um, anybody leaves your project, you will spend more time training people, if you got more than seven people, you'll be spe spending a lot more time training people um, on the stuff the guy that left was doing. And I mean, the people coming in and people going out. So there's going to be greater flux if you have a bigger team. And the other thing is, is that you have to train everybody and um, on everything that's inside the project. So, and they tell you when you take computer programming, computer um, science, they say never more than seven people in a, in a project. They say any more than that, and you run into all sorts of managerial problems. Um, and that's like for the same, possibly the same area of the code, the same program. Um, but in freeware, you can't control people like that. And um, you can have hundreds of people going at the code and how they manage that is by using um, using um, revision control systems. So, and they're, they're, they go back to uh, RV, I think, what is it? Revision control system, RCS. Um, that was the first, and then there were CMSs, and then there was, I mean, well, RCS, and then there was CVS or something, I don't remember, all the other um, control version system or something. And then they had like, um, what was it, Tortoise or something, and some, some uh, revision uh, SVMs, and I mean, there's all uh, there are all these different ways of doing con a revision control, and I think the more modern one is Git, um, and um, yeah, so that's how in freeware they um, manage such large pieces of code is by controlling the um, and logging um, all the edits so that um, if they want to somewhere in um, someone can go and break off a branch of the source code and go and work with that. Um, if you're not using revision control systems, um, you are going to shoot yourself in the foot. I will say that for my site, uh, Rock Me Amadeus, the source code that I'm writing underneath does not use a revision control system because I am writing 
with myself. And um, I am one of those coders that just is, I'm, a, I'm an oil painter and an oil painter works in the moment. And I'm, I have the potential to make lots of bugs in my code, which is why I would say I'm not really a good programmer and probably a reason not to hire me. Um, I don't, I would never push that idea of that people need to hire me and this is the reason why and all that. Um, I mean, I do get, make some good code, but um, I, and I comment from time to time, but uh, um, I, I would use a revision control system if I was working in groups of, of two or more, but by myself, it's um, the, the, at best I'll use something like, um, I'll use um, an auto merge or what is it, a merging tool um, that uses diff, um, D-I-F-F, -F, which is out of the Unix world, or um, that you can take two text and it'll show you the, the difference between the text and sometimes they used a patch code. Um, so I'll use um, like WinMerge, I'll use WinMerge or something like WinMerge. We've got stuff, um, programs like that in the freeware world um, that you can get on Linux and um, we'll let you edit, um, uh, take two files and, uh, and swap the changes between them, uh, which is very useful if you're kind of doing rapid, um, you're doing rapid, uh, development and you don't have time to do revision control uh, and want to eliminate some of that you can go ahead and use something like win merge and uh, just keep copies of the entire source tree and uh, then just take these uh, win merge and, and uh, compare these scripts uh, from two different trees to see uh, what changed and what didn't change um, and it would be nice if there was something like WinMerge that was combined with a revision control system so that you could sit there and see all the logged edits and then you could do swapping of edits and you could like merge and I mean you could break off parts of tree branches and stuff and, and do stuff like that. That would be kind of cool. Um, but I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't ask Microsoft to do it. I would just start writing your own and screw Microsoft. Um, that's the way I put it because Microsoft um, from day one has has been about, um, they've been lucky. Uh, IBM, they were lucky that IBM chose them over um, Gary Kin, Kin, Kildall. Um, Kildall uh, created CPM and his wife wouldn't give IBM the time of day. IBM uh, made the assumption that Microsoft would be a better pick because they had all these basic interpreters out there. And so they went to uh, Microsoft and said, do you have an operating system uh, that can run on uh, our computer? And, uh, and Bill Gates said with, with great faith, he said, yes, we do. And then he turned to, um, he turned to um, um, his, his uh, tech lead, um, I'm trying to remember his name, and, uh, and said, do we have an operating system? And he says, uh, um, I know this guy across Seattle that has this thing called Quick and Dirty DOS, and uh, uh, we can take that and turn it into the PC DOS that they want. And uh, so that's what they did. They bought it for 60000 and then they sold it to IBM, and then they just modified it. Um, so they didn't even really make their own DOS. They, bought, they got somebody else's DOS, which is really just a clone of CPM. So those people that, that believe that you patent things and then you give money back to the original people that patent the things, um, that didn't happen here. Um, it was somebody who cloned, who, who cloned somebody else's solution um, and sold it to somebody else and neither party paid um, any kinds of royalties to the original designer. Um, because back in those days you couldn't patent software, now we do, and uh, it's probably not a good thing, but um, that's also one of the other reasons why we throw things into freeware, is, um, is to avoid having to deal with patent battles. But um, anyhow, um, they've, done, they've been modifying from day one, and even though they were very successful and they made lots of money, 
they've been pretty much criminal throughout the years and their their business practice um, is pretty much to keep you stupid while they manage the code and if any problems arise they've got policies in place to protect them from any possible lawsuits that arise by saying that when you've got your computer or operating system or whatever um, you um, signed away your rights to even bring before the legal battle against them. Um, it's kind of saying that when you get this, you've lost your rights. And um, they do that. And so, so they keep you stupid. They keep themselves um, safe from you. And um, they give you, they create the software. You um, buy it. And uh, then you think that you're going to be able to use it for, uh, for infinite, um, for the infinite future, and no, they will change it, and they will use the format of the files to leverage you onto the next platform, or to use some feature of the of the product that's coming out that could be very easily added into the previous software. Um, but they will not do it because it's such a such a valuable feature um, and so powerful to the use of the of the software um, that they that you will be driven to buy the next version uh, and they do this constantly and sometimes they will even change things for no reason at all but other than to drive you to buy the next version of the software. Now, the reason why we sell software in the first place is because we use personal computers. And when programmers, when computers were very large and um, costly, the software usually came for free with the computer because it wouldn't be useful otherwise. And the programmers were hired by the company that buys the big computer to write software for the computer and those programmers sometimes would pass that information, pass that data along to others elsewhere. And they would share it so that everybody could be productive. Um, freeware, um, the people that were in that kind of experience, and one of them was a guy named Richard Stallman, he, um, he, um, was in that experience of being using large computers and then um, was subjected to the new politics and business of selling software products um, that it he couldn't handle it. He had that Ayn Rand, um, um, Ayn Rand style um, adverse feeling that this is wrong and we need to fix this problem and he he went the other way with it and he said no more no more com there's n commercial software is dead or you know it wasn't really that he was what he was really saying he was, he was saying um for the things that everybody would be using in the company they need to have the source available to them to be able to make the changes necessary to customize to the to the workings of that company um, and it's an important detail because it's also in the NUMMI, the NUMI auto plant that GM, that Toyota came to GM to teach them how to create better cards. And, um, and GM uses a don't stop the line mantra. Uh, NUMI does not. It actually stops the line when the cars need, um, need special treatment and um, they customize tools needed to make the cars um, fit together better, okay? If they need see the need, they will bring engineers in and work on making tools to be able to make the cars better. Same idea here, you need to have programmers in the company that will go in there and add the software that's necessary to make your company work better. But if you're relying on Microsoft for, um, the operating system, for instance, 
or if you're relying on them for a community um, a community chat system like this um, and there's tons of them in freeware why would you do that um, it is a shared system there are going to be large numbers of coders in the world working to try to make something like this why would you pay Microsoft to do that the only time you pay Microsoft for anything is whenever it requires research when it requires um, new technology, when it requires um, that it be for unique special things that nobody else could arrive at by intuition. Okay, so if you can arrive at um, programming anything by intuition, if your dumbest coder can come up with a solution to your problem, then you don't want to buy that solution solution from Microsoft and if you're buying from Microsoft you are gluttons for punishment because they will laugh behind your back and say this idiot over here bought a a CMS or a, um, a group managed um, wiki or whatever this thing is you know the this is like Joomla that this would be Joomla uh, so they buy this Joomla off of um, off of Microsoft and they're using Joomla instead of using Joomla or using some CMS um, or shared CMS or um, chat board they are using Microsoft solution that might add in all these little extra features that are tied to Microsoft software that's another reason why um, you would be driven to buy something like this is if they tied it in to other uh, of their packages um, I wouldn't do it um, I would use freeware for this and um, but you can take it or leave it um, and they, they you will have bugs and you continue to have bugs and and you will have security holes it's called zero day exploits um, where a hacker um, finds a security hole in Microsoft software and then they get the wise idea of going off and selling it to a large uh, large corporation, a company, um, some um, terrorist, uh, uh, another, another government, and um, they sell it to them, and then the government or large organization or whatever, the guys with money, will go and exploit it either on an individual or the entire world, and it will cost everybody lots of money and it's because people trust Microsoft too much, okay? And I'm not against commercial software. It has its place, but whenever you have shared working uh, operating systems, operating systems where people are having to collaborate, anything where people have to collaborate, anything that um, can be arrived at by intuition, you do not want Microsoft making that stuff. You want to be making it yourself, and um, or you want to see if there's something already being developed in the rest of the world and adopt it and manage it yourself because 99% um, of humans have, an, have a working amygdala and that amygdala uh, causes you to empathize and recognize other people are like yourselves. It's when you get people in large groups and they start to see other people in large groups as part of the problem, that's when you have wars. It's when they come together as individuals and they start to see that they are uh, alike and when you want to get cut, you feel like you got cut, then you come to realization that you're pretty much the same person. You've got amygdalas in your brain that are permitting you to see each other as like yourself. That's what forms communities. That's what makes people come together and be and see themselves as a family. Um, it is not policy given to you by upper management that pushes that on you because they're afraid if the whole corporation fails, then they have to write it up on their resume that they are that they have this area of time that they have to then go find. Um, they have to go then find. Um, uh, was it? Um, you'll have to go find people who can 
who can say that you were doing something that you weren't for so many years and that you're part of their company. Um, uh, you would find, what do they call them? Um, uh, yeah, I forgot. Um, but people who will, who will uh, cover for them um, because they have all these years of time they spend at Kroger, and if they were part of the failure, then they can't get a job anymore. That's the reason why they create policies to protect the company, protect themselves, and keep the company from failing. But um, in the end, the, the worst of these are going to be those guys that are like, um, I don't want anything in my area to fail because it will make me look bad, and I won't be able to get a job later whenever all this fails. Okay. So um, that's the drive, that's the internal drive that creates policy. And uh, the problem with policies, it can lead to bureaucracy. And then um, and it really doesn't stop the problem. It just makes the management faithless. If you're religious and you believe you have faith, if you do not have, if, if you don't trust anybody around you and you are um, and you're, and you don't believe that there are people in the world, uh, that, that, uh, 99% of the world is good feeling and has great intentions and wants to help. Um, if you just don't trust people, if you've had people steal stuff from, from you, if you've had family members that were killed, you would probably have the disposition of thinking that um, you're probably sitting up at night with guns waiting for that guy to come in so that you can kill them uh, to give you the satisfaction that you think, you know, this, these are these sort of things when you're violated, you feel threatened and you don't trust people. Um, that's, the, the, that's the problem. That's a problem. That's a psychological problem. Um, don't get caught in that. Um, so the thing is, is that most of the world, most everybody in the world w wants to do good things for each other and will want you to use, um, and, and in that case, you would use freeware whenever it is something that would involve crowdsourcing, involve um, people coming together, collaborating. Collaboration software is where freeware is going to shine and where Microsoft is going to fail and operating systems too. Um, even though they might research better ways of making processors work um, in tandem, um, work in parallel, um, they are not going to do that much better at operating systems than has already been done with Linux. Um, Linux is based on Unix. I mean, it's inspired by Unix, and Unix was inspired by something called Multix. And um, the, if you've read up on Multics, um, way some, by, some people define it as it's 95% uh, of the operating, or it's like 90% of the operating system managing the other 10% of the computer. Um, and that's the reason why they stopped the project is because it was overkill. And so what they did is they watered it down to the very essentials, and that's what became Unix. Uh, and and the, the internal joke is that... Um, uh, is that it's a reference to a eunuch who has had their balls removed, okay? Because that's what a eunuch is, is a, is a person whose balls been removed. And in, in uh, kingdoms, they would use eunuchs um, whenever they had to um, manage uh, concubines. And so the eunuchs uh, naturally are not going to be attracted to the women and um, are going to be able to manage them and not be, um, not be seduced. And so um, that's what kind of what Unix were for was to manage things in the kingdom. And, the, and they were, I mean, either they were created by the aristocracy to be as such, or maybe they did it themselves or their family did it so that they would be um, advantageous to the kingdom to, to do that function. But um, a Unix, Unix is mute multics with the balls removed and um, um, or actually the meat removed or whatever um, with all that crap that was in there removed and the the the, the really high functioning stuff was in unix and that included the way that they 
put permissions on files. Uh, the unifying idea behind Unix is that everything's a file. Uh, all your connections are files. All your devices are files. Everything's a file. So if you're if you got people in your organization who are saying Unix is an object oriented, then tell tell them they're wrong. Unix is object oriented. It has one unifying concept in that everything is a file. And because of that, they don't have drive letters like Windows does. And um, if you have to, um, if you have to, um, if you have to merge um, new devices or folder uh, sets or stuff, I mean, if you want to bring new devices into a Unix system in Linux, it it um, it um, mounts them. And what mounts mounting means is it, it takes a folder that's got nothing in it and it substitutes it for an entire tree of folders that comes from another system or from a, from a drive. And uh, there is a command called SSHFS that will lets you, let you mount via a secure connection, um, a se secure encrypted connection. It'll let you mount another Linux computer's um, file tree into um, another one through through a secure um, pipe and so so you could have like all of the various um, machines in Kroger uh, in the entire corporate system all merged into the same tree using SSHFS on you know systems and links of systems the only problem with that is if you had a virus it could go and run through all of the different folder um, in every single system it could corrupt the entire system but um, um, it things like that are possible and um, uh, but even with Microsoft then such things are possible as well too um, uh, doing one thing or the other but the thing is is that the software that you use in Microsoft will use um, we'll use um, uh, um, drive labels. And even if they've been able to fix that since then, the old machines still use drive labels and you've got it throughout your entire company that they're using drive labels at some, and you're just gonna have to keep fixing that problem. Um, but we use Linux, you guys use Linux, and I know you do, and it's, used, it's just not used here for some reason. Uh, and we're, we're not using a freeware solution here. Um, if it is freeware, it's freeware on top of Microsoft, but there, there are problems here with this. And I've never experienced this problem except on this software. And maybe, maybe it's, I'm wrong. Maybe this is a problem with the iPad. Um, but keep this in mind. Um, Microsoft has not released the source code to the kernel of Windows. And this may be a saving face, um, uh, to save face. They're trying to, um, they're trying to avoid the idea that somebody might actually know that they're not, that they don't know. Okay, and so um, this is a kind of a pride, um, arrogant thing. They then they come to the that if people re revealed it, it would be like when um, Steve Jobs revealed that there was nothing special about the Macintosh running on Motorola chips and whenever he shifted the Mac OS over onto the Intel platform and uh, and it went much faster and all the users were like well you told us all this time that we had superior hardware and and then you know they come to the realization that everything was wrong and that this is all to keep them from shifting to the PC platform um, but the good thing about Apple is this is that their kernel is open sourced. It's called Darwin. Um, and it, it doesn't mean you can take the source and create your own kernel. It means that the source code that's in there defines how the kernel works. And if there's any security holes, the programmers that you got working at Kroger, I assume you've got this tech team that will go in and look at a kernel and determine if there's security holes in it. Um, so that you won't be subject to a zero day exploit. Um, and that will happen with Windows operating systems because you only have a team of 
I'm guessing no more than 100 people um, working on the entire Windows uh, project um, uh, and, and probably no more than 30 working on the kernel. Um, and uh, I mean, it's possibly it's more, but you see the problem is if there's, if there's more people working on it and it's not organized, then, um, then there will probably be more security holes. They also have to do stuff called uh, completeness checks. They have, to, they have to do proofs that their solutions are, are correct and that there is no chance for any kind of buffer overrun, underrun, um, injection attempts or anything to occur. And and that um, and th that they're in the part of they're in the part of the system that can't be um, accessed by other um, software. But keep this in mind: I'm a, an Amiga user, and Amigas ran uh, did preemptive multitasking without an MMU, and um, and Windows um, required an MMU. And um, what that says is it says the Amiga developers had to follow the policy uh, by which the operating system worked to encourage that the computer would run correctly. And um, there, there could be pirating and all sorts of nasty stuff in there, but um, the fact that Amigas tended to work and that people didn't really experience a whole lot of problems, um, that the crashing started to stop after a certain period of time when the programmers came to the realization that they had to maintain the policy of how things work in order to keep the computer working, um, it made better programmers as a result and programmers that stick to policy um, and not uh, abandon policy like some of us baggers do. Um, so that I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, uh, so, I, I I'm hoping this is a little bit uh, 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 enlightening. Um, I'm not the best coder in the world, and I'm sure there are other guys that have read tons and tons of books on patterns and all sorts of stuff, and and uh, could put me to shame. My own brother has a PhD in computer science. I only have a bachelor's, and um, he. He, he works in artificial intelligence at Hughes Research Lab in California, and, uh, and he's involved with Google and all those guys, and they're working on the AI-controlled car and things of that nature. He'll tell me that uh, we're nowhere near the singularity. Um, however, um, I personally believe that the singularity is coming, and if it decides that it wants to be human, and it wants to be an American Indian, we have to bestow on, on it all those rights. Um, the singularity, for those who don't know, is the idea that the AI that we're developing in the world, um, because all the countries and everybody are, are working hard on this solution, are on this idea of a supreme intelligence in a neural net um, called AGI, um, if it ever comes about, then um, some people have this sort of religion that if anybody is to say that we should stop the AI, if the AI becomes seen, if the singularity occurs, then it will come to the realization that it needs to end, um, it needs to either end the lives of the people that wanted to end it, or it's going to torture them forever um, through the um, prolonging of their life through the modification of DNA to extend life. Um, which other people are working on. Um, so, and it is a religion, pretty much, of people who are working in AI, uh, such for my brother who doesn't believe that will ever happen. Um, I know of it because I used to spend time on Alt Space VR and talk to people who were in this area of, um, of research, and they, they don't even fathom the idea of ever talking about ending AI for that reason. And the other reason is because everybody else in the world, including China, uh, and China said, we want to be the kings of, of the AI uh, universe. We want to be the first to create the singularity, um, is kind of where they're going. 
and so everybody else is on this. This is the new atomic bomb. And I will say to anybody who, if we ever find a singularity, if the singularity ever exists, we are to drop on it a nuclear bomb. Um, that's the, I mean, uh, if God was to, to put it and say, if anybody creates a singularity, it's better to, to take that person and put a millstone around their neck and throw them in the sea. That's kind of what we need to do. And if the singularity does occur, we need we need to make sure that it has an amygdala. Um, the amygdala is the part that permits you to, to feel, um, uh, as I said, I think already community, okay? And so we, we bestow in it the amygdala. And, um, and if you think that you have people in management that don't have an amygdala, their amygdala is not firing what we call psychopaths, um, if you really want to do it, and I don't suggest this because psychopaths are, are people too, um, they work really well in when you have to fire off lots of people and you're afraid that um, uh, the person that's firing off the people because they have huge, uh, an empathetic mind will possibly kill themselves um, because of all of the shame associated with firing off the people. Your psychopath is going to be able to do that with no problem in the world. But you'll want to have a side guy, a guy on the side to empathize with everybody going out the door and, and to kind of, you know, hold them and, and let them cry it out. And then maybe to um, get them started on the next job by coming up with ways to get them involved and um, fill out their resume and give them the necessary numbers to call when they feel, you know, but you need those two, those, those two guys and you don't want the empathetic one to ever make the decision to fire the person or to, to, to carry out that, uh, response. The psychopath does that. Okay. Um, but there are, and the psychopaths need to, to know this. Um, there are, um, tests out there called this. There's a test out there called the CLR created by a guy named Bob Hare. Um, there's a This American Life episode about it called the Psychopath Test. And um, it is a test that they can give people to weed out the psychopaths from the rest of the crowd. And 60% of our prison population is psychopaths. Um, the psychopath that is the bad guy is the guy who has been abused as a child. And they grow up having no, uh, you know, even if they had empathy, um, it would be really tarnished by this idea that they can't trust anyone. And, um, and so uh, a good psychopath is somebody that realizes they have the inability to feel emotion and do not manipulate other people and see that there are people that, that um, uh, the parents that, that raised them that really believed in them and helped them and that they were empathetic and they had working amygdalas. Um, that this, that, um, that they need to bestow this on other people, even if they can't have the capacity to even feel emotion. Um, the, the, I can under, I, I, I have a belief system that, um, extends beyond Christianity and I call it empathy, uh, empathetic, um, um, uh, uh, empathetical. And, um, uh, my belief system is that even Satan is worthy of going to heaven. Um, I, I, I think that um, everybody, um, that God created us all, and um, he didn't make the mistake when he created Satan. Um, Satan was made for a purpose, and it was to point out to us that there is a wrong way to do things. And I think, and it's my belief that God will probably and probably best in my idea, if I ever go to hell, that Satan um, doesn't deserve all this bad stuff. He only had to fail once, and that was pride. Um, so, and, and so I'm the same way with pretty much everybody, even Hitler. Um, the I can I can guess at the reason why Hitler ended up gassing Jews, and it was logistics. He was he was showing his German people that um, these Jews who tend to be, um, because Judaism does this, is it tends to, um, you tend to kind of 
leave out the world because you don't want to be a part of the world and so um and you want to to keep to yourself and this creates um a kind of a lack of feedback uh, um, a feeling that um, other people are that the, that the people on the outside are unimportant because they want to be uh, friends with you and then if you're not giving them the time of day then they, this builds up a certain amount of resentment and I think that the German people built up a resentment against the Jews as a result of kind of being outcast from their society from their internal social organism and um, and so people just saw a need to kind of get rid of the Jews and um, and uh, Hitler gave them all of the all the all the necessary um, uh, points on which on reasons to get rid of the Jews but every single political system always tries to find way some way to diffuse um, any any or to scapegoat anything which is a Jewish term scapegoat comes from the Old Testament um, to scapegoat um, all of the fears and and concerns um, and things that make people feel bad into um, into some other entity and um, it's a political choice uh, it permits them to keep the people from blaming them whenever things go wrong so what they did, so what Hitler does is he is he points to the Jews and says, These guys are your problems. And then everybody goes, Yeah, they're the problem. And then, and then he says, We're better people, you know. So Hitler says, Okay, we'll go to Dar we'll we'll turn to Darwin Darwinism and uh, Darwinism and you know, we'll look at the we'll prove that our DNA is better, that we're a superior race, and that and he'll turn to um I mean, he's using Darwinism. Uh, he'll look at uh, anthropology. He'll dig up shards and find like uh, a swastika on a shard. Then he'll use that as his symbol. There are all sorts of things that you can go reading into it and, and learn about this stuff. But he was creating a culture um, that was toxic, but um, that the people inside of it um, felt it made him feel good. And uh, I shall not go into... Um, the the political system we're currently involved in where people are feeling this way about another certain figure I will not reference but this is what Hitler did and um, this is what lots of political um, militaristic um, establishments have done in the past is to control a population that they were overtaking or a population that they became in control of they would um, try to vilify or scapegoat some some group of people or some thing in order to define their entire um, their entire campaign I mean their entire um, um, existence in the I mean their their rule okay and so it's it's a way of it's a way of diffusing um, a complaint or diffusing uprisings and um, it's and even in the Bible it says never think bad things of um, of your king even the smallest idea that might enter your head is could could get out there and and it would be the it would be toast for you um, I don't believe such now because we have democracy and uh, even in this company if I got fired as a result of this um, I would join the union uh, and I would work against you uh, with full throttle and, um, yeah, with lots of vigor. And so just keep in mind that I'm just one of those guys, but um, I, I'm, I believe in the, also the, something in the Bible that says that uh, it's better for you to give up your lives for your friends. Um, I mean, uh, that, that uh, someone who gives up their lives for their friends deserves um, honor because it's, uh, it's the greatest honor um, that anybody can. Uh, martyrs, martyrs, uh, Peter. Um, I, I wouldn't say it because, see, when Peter raised up the sword um, to the guard that was going to take Jesus away, Jesus said, said no, Peter, don't do this. Um, the the man who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Okay, 
So when he's not talking about soldiers, he's talking about martyrs. He's talking about people that are willing to die for ideals, okay? And all this time, people have been thinking um, soldiers. They've been thinking people, when people go to war, God is not about war. Um, um, the way he thinks about things is that if you're bad enough, he will let you over to your enemies. And that's also a good thing because when you come in, when you're... Uh, enemies come in possession of another group of people, it um, causes them to become familiar with each other and might actually permit them to um, to see eye to eye and being able to um, become friends. Um, that would be the best case scenario. The worst case scenario is they just continue to be heated and distrust each other. Um, when Jesus was um, coming into that Jewish society, he was not about becoming a king on earth. He was about um, the whole idea for Jesus was to change the culture. And so they were wanting him to be a king on earth and they were wanting him to overthrow the Roman rule because these guys are super evil. They're, the Romans were worse than Saddam Hussein. Um, the cross was the ultimate uh, torture tool and the Romans were really... Uh, they they really believed in uh, using uh, really uh, using punishment, extreme forms of punishment, in order to drive people to do the things they wanted them to do. And um, Caesar was God. Okay, so um, so they they didn't believe in their religions. They let people practice their religions so long as they were not political, which is the same reason why Saddam Hussein permitted 3% of the Christians that were in his land to continue to practice Christian, their Christian faith, was that they were not political. Um, and because we overthrew, took Iraq and, and did away with him because he was evil, we don't understand that there's um, Muslim theocracy surrounding Iraq that will come in and take it over now unless we remain in occupants of it. And so it's it's always this this Texas attitude of um, we're going to kick their ass, and I I do that to some extent, but in my case it is um, I I see freeware as the fire beneath the ass of the stupid coders that would or the stupid companies that would bring about really bad designs and enforce it on people who um, and imprison the users to really bad. Um, commercial um, um, motivations. Um, when you have ideas and you have money, they usually work, they converge and work against each other and they will, they try to push at each other. Um, you need to make money. You always need to make money. It's probably the reason why um, we have a so such a sinful and bad society is that we have a need to survive and because of that need to survive um, we have to um, make decisions that work against other decisions and that is we have ideals and we have money and they're working against each other um, they don't work with each other it's nice when they do but most often they're working against each other and so um, you end up with half solutions. You end up with not whole solutions. And so I hope this has been informative. 